Good morning, Christian Church of Litchfield. Hey, we're happy to have you uh, with us today. If you're visiting with us, we welcome you to our services, and it's our prayer. It'll be a blessing uh, to you. Uh, thank you, Ron, for that incredible message and song. That's, that's one of my favorite, favorite songs. It's ministered to me many a time when I've really been down. We're in a series of messages this summer on David, and we call it Defining Moments. You know, where decisions are made at a crossroad and your life is never the same. Today, we come to part three and we look at everybody needs a friend. You know, when life falls apart, when it caves in, when you have a spouse that you're living with, that has dementia or Alzheimer's, when the doctor comes in and he says it's cancer, when the boss comes in and hands you a pink slip, when you receive that divorce notice, when you've been lied about and unjustly criticized, you can use a friend. We know how that those friends in our lives that come to our side when our world is falling apart just make all the difference in the world. I was reading this week and it said soon after uh, Jack Benny, the famous comedian, died George Burns was interviewed on TV about his famous friend. And here's what he had to say, uh, George Burns, about Jack Benny. We had a wonderful relationship for nearly 55 years, he said. Jack and I laughed together. We played together. We worked together. We ate together. I suppose most of those years and days, we talked every single day. Wow, that's a unique, close, intimate friendship. Richard Esley described these special friends as this, someone to be with when you have to get away but you can't bear to be by yourself. He says an intimate friend is one who knows enough about you to run you, but he doesn't, partly because he loves you, partly because he knows you could do the same in return. Those are close friends, aren't they, when, when you have just poured out your deepest, inmost secrets, and you literally trust them with with your life. Now, we all know about friends. Some are very casual. People you work with, co-workers, classmates, neighbors, uh, acquaintances. Um, but then there are those where you talk to them every day. You know, you just, just connect with them. There's just a blending of spirits and of souls and of values and of standards and the personalities, and um, yeah, you're in each other's homes regularly, you eat together, you go to ball games regularly, and uh, those, those are deep, deep friendships. Today we're going to talk about the deepest of friendships. And Bob Russell once said, if a person has one or two of these in a lifetime, they are blessed. And maybe this message will challenge you to be that kind of a friend to somebody who's at that crossroad. And whether or not you come alongside may make all the difference for their future. Today we're going to continue this series on David and we look at the close friendship between David and Jonathan. Here's a very close, intimate, 
friendship that we really want to take and spend some time looking at today. Now on the surface, when you look at it, you'd think they have nothing in common. They would not be friends at all. You have David, the eighth son of a shepherd, the youngest, doing the chores on the farm, taking care of the smelly sheep out in the hills. And then you have Jonathan, son of King Saul, would naturally be the next heir to the throne. You've got city boy, you got country boy. You got the palace, you got the pasture. They have nothing in common, so it would seem. But that's just not the case. So we're going to begin today. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to ask, usually I say turn your Bibles, but we're going through so many scriptures. They'll be on your PowerPoint, and I'm afraid if you try looking them up, you're going to really get lost and say, where are we at? What's he saying now? But hopefully you'll be able to follow it in order on the PowerPoint. So here we go. We're going to look at how it was that David and Jonathan became close friends. So if you're filling in your outline, here we go. Number one, the first thing that attributed to it, and we saw it in the first message, was that King Saul was kind of a nutcase. There were times when that demonic spirit-like would just take over in his life, and, and boy, nobody wanted to be around him, and, and they called David in to play the harp for Jonathan's father, King Saul. And so it seems like Saul was in that situation quite a bit. And he really liked David in those early years. And so just the fact that he was called into the palace to minister and to play for his father, no doubt, gave these guys who were probably teenagers at the time, you know how teenage boys are, when he wasn't playing for King Saul, maybe they got talking and said, hey, what is that? Oh, well, that, that's my, my bow and arrow. Well, I use a slingshot. Hey, let's go out, and, and, and you don't know how to develop, but it just kind of developed naturally over time because of the fact he was called to the palace. Had that not happened, probably um, they would have never been friends. And David's outcome of his life would have been dramatically different with King Saul had he not had Jonathan go to bat for him as we want to see today. Second factor, I think, and the reason that they became great friends was this. Their personalities, they, they connected, not collided. You know, uh, there are some people you just don't get along with. What do you say? Man, our personalities, we just clashed. We just collided. It was a train wreck, you know, from get-go. Others, you just automatically connect. You say, wow. It just seems to be that, that bond, you know. Now, when you look at David and Jonathan, they were both type A personalities. They had a lot in, in common. Uh, they were, they loved living life on the edge. Today, they'd be dry, uh, riding motorcycles together. They'd be doing skydiving. They'd be doing Mountain Dew commercials, you know, on TV uh, together. Uh, they were risk takers, and it, they loved the adventure. We're going, we know that David, uh, we saw last week, take on that nearly 10-foot giant Goliath. And when nobody else wanted to tackle him, he says, man, let's do it. Let's go at it. And incredible. Jonathan was a lot like that way. We know about David, but we're going to read some scripture here about, about uh, Jonathan. 1 Samuel 14, 1, 4 says, One day Jonathan said to his armor bearer, just the two of them, Come on, let's go over to where the Philistines have their outpost. To reach the Philistine outpost, Jonathan had to go down between two rocky cliffs. There's just two of them. And they're going to try and penetrate the Philistine stronghold. Okay, next verse. So they climbed up using both hands and feet, and the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed those who came behind them. They killed some 20 men in all. Man, that's, that's crazy. Jonathan wasn't a pampered prince. He said, man... I'm not even going to tell my dad what I'm doing. He'd have a uh, fit. 
Uh, we're just going to do it. So when you look at their personalities, you can really see the blending of, of, of personalities here. But the third factor, and this is the huge one, they both had an incredible faith in God. Remember last week when we looked at David going before Goliath? He says today, after the Philistine giant had, had cursed David and, and ridiculed him, he says today, there's a God in Israel. He's going to deliver you into my hands. And all the world will know that God saves, not by the sword of the spear. The battle is his. It was constant praise to God for who he is before the victory was ever won. Jonathan was the same way. Look, look at a verse back here as he talks about this battle going to the Philistines when they're going to be totally outnumbered and, and high risk of venture. Let's go across to the outpost of those pagans, Jonathan said to his armor bearer. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle, whether he has many warriors or only a few. He said it really doesn't make any difference, you know, because God is just so great. That really has to be the foundation for, if you want a deep, personal, close, intimate friendship, has to be built upon the rock-solid foundation of faith in, in, in God. Now, rest of our time today, we're going to look at the ingredients for that intimate friendship here. So here we go. Number one, uh, from David and Jonathan, we can learn this about friendship. Number one, it develops naturally over time. You just got to give it time. You don't force it. It grows. It develops. It matures. Let's read about David and Jonathan. 1 Samuel 18. After David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. Now verses 3 and 4. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. That's a true friend. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. And you may wonder now here, what's he doing taking off his robe and, and his tunic and his sword and bow and, and, and belt? Most commentators think that he is acknowledging, you know, by all rights, I'm the next king because my father's king. But I know God's will. And because I follow God, his will is fine with me. I acknowledge you're going to be the next king. You're going to be the next leader. I'm not going to be that person. And I am willing to play second fiddle to you, David. You're God's pick to be king. That, this is such a powerful, powerful verse. So friendship, it develops naturally over time. You just can't force it or, or, or push it. Most of you know one of my favorite movies is What About Bob? Remember, have you seen the movie What About Bob? I, I tell you, if you're down the dumps, just rent that movie or uh, uh, go buy it, whatever. Uh, look it up on Netflix. Whatever. You got to watch it. Uh, it it's, it's hilarious. It's, uh, I just love that movie, What About Bob? It's where this guy's a nutcase, and he has a psychologist, which he desperately needs, Leo Marvin. And uh, Leo Marvin first thinks he can help this guy, and then he, does, he gets to hate Bob. You know, he can't wait to get away from him. He's going on vacation, and uh, Bob says to Dr. Marvin, hey, hey, he said, now I know you're going to be gone on vacation and we can't do our counseling sessions, but hey, let's get this friendship thing going. <laughs> no, wasn't going to happen. Wasn't going to happen. Throughout the movie, Bob tries to force it, but it just doesn't happen. Now be real careful. If, if you have a casual friend and uh, give it time. What I'm saying is, you know, there are some people that after doing a couple things together, then they want to do everything together. 
and they begin to make unreasonable demands and time commitments they want from, from their friend. And secure people will back away from that friendship real fast. They'll say, we're not there. <laughs> we're not there yet. And what they read into it is your insecurity. Insecure people or needy people. Hey, I need you. Hey, man, let's do this. Hey, I need you. I want. And, and so, well, well, wait a minute. You, you, you know, just, 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 just give it time. And the deepest, deepest relationships and friendships are those that people just give time. So, so true in a dating relationship, you know. Uh, there are people that on the second date, they're, they're spilling their beans. Maybe first day, they're telling them in most secrets, and they're telling the other person far more than they ever wanted to know. And they're thinking, <laughs> when this date is over, it is over, you know, because they're, they're not ready for that. They, they just want to hang out and talk uh, casual and, and just do some fun stuff together and, and, and let it build and not just immediately jump into the deep end of the pool. And those relationships are, are, are just, just so important. Okay, now we're going to talk about the intimate friend from here on out. Secondly, an intimate friend will stand up for you behind your back. If he doesn't, he's not a friend, and you better bail out of that relationship ASAP. Uh, not a friend if they don't defend you behind uh, your back. None of us want a friend that's a friend to our face and a foe when our back is turned. Let's go ahead and look and see what we have here on the, with Dave and Jonathan. We read, when the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and, and cymbals. Well, <laughs> the problem is they're not dancing for King Saul. They're dancing for David. Let's read on. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. From that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Man, that is so important, that verse. He loved David. David had done a lot for King Saul. Nothing will destroy a friendship any quicker than jealousy. At times you're going to have to learn to play second fiddle. Let's read on. <clears throat> the very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day. <clears throat> but Saul had a spear in his hand, and he suddenly hurled it at David intending to pin him to the wall. That, that's not nice. But David <laughs> escaped him twice. You know, that's when you begin to say, I think I need to put out some job resumes uh, at a different palace, you know. Uh, that's worse than getting a pink slip, you know, uh, getting a pin slip, pinning to the wall. Nutcase. Let's read on. Saul now urged his servants and his son Jonathan to assassinate David. But Jonathan, what's he do? Because of his strong affection for David, told him what his father was planning. Tomorrow morning he warned him, you must find a hiding place out in, in the fields. So we're going to see that time and time again that Jonathan defended uh, David to his father Saul. So much so that there's a time when he wants to try and kill his own son Jonathan, King Saul does. The guy is a real, real nutcase. Proverbs 17, uh, we've got one more scripture here. And it says, the next morning, Jonathan spoke with his father about David, saying many good things about him. The king must not sin against his servant David. Jonathan said, he's ne never done anything to harm you. He's always helped you 
in any way he could. So there you have his defense of uh, David before his father King Saul. So an intimate friend will stand up for you uh, behind your, your, your back. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. You know, there are going to be times in that friendship where maybe you're going to have to play second fiddle. And you're just going to have to swallow your pride and your ego, and you're going to say, hey, that's, it doesn't really matter. And that's not easy to do. You know, Bob Russell, I've quoted him probably as much as or more than any other preacher, preached for nearly 40 years in the Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, took the church from 125 to nearly 20,000 attending there on weekends. Uh, one of the, our, our largest church of our brotherhood, uh, one of the largest in the United States. And he's in the limelight, you know, he's the featured speaker of the North American, all conventions, everybody in Christianity and uh, Christian churches and Church of Christ. No, no, Bob Russell, he's just a household whole word. What they don't know is Bob Russell has a brother. And he preaches to a much smaller church and just a really small church, but he's been a faithful minister there. And he said, Bob has said this about his brother. He said, my brother is one of the classiest individuals you'll ever meet. He said, he's my biggest supporter and cheerleader. He would call me up every time we're going into a new building program or we took up over a million dollar offering and say, way to go, Bob. So, so happy for you. And he said he's had very little of personal achievements in his own ministry and in his own life. But he said one day, he said his brother sat down with him and Bob and his brother were, were talking and his brother said, you know, he said, I was real excited. I got some people from our church to go on a mission trip to Zimbabwe. And he says, the moment we land there and get off the plane, we meet some missionaries and we introduce ourselves. And they say, are you Bob Russell's brother? He says, I can't even go to the other part of the world without running into you, Bob. And he says, every Sunday we have this sweet little old lady. She comes up to me before church starts and she says, Oh, I want you to know I heard your brother Bob on the radio this morning already, and he is the most wonderful preacher I've ever heard. He says, I just grin, so yeah, we all love Bob. Yeah. He says, Bob, he says, I love you and hate you at the same time. You know, there are times when you're in that situation, it's a real test, you know, and that's how it's been with David and Jonathan, where it's passed, and Jonathan said, you know what, I'm fine playing second, second fiddle. Ruth Calkin, in her book, Tell Me Again, Lord, I Forget. Lord, help me to be her friend, to care for her genuinely, without envy shrinking my heart. When I see her at the banquet tonight, poised, radiant, beautifully attired, may I congratulate her with honest enthusiasm, regardless of the fact that both of our husbands were eligible for the promotion. But it was her husband who, who won it. So if you're going to be that friend, you have to be a faithful friend and defend that person when their back is turned because that's what we want from a friend we don't want those fair weather friends real quickly number three let's let's move on <clears throat> and this is a tough one an intimate friend will tell you the truth even though it's unpleasant let that sink in a moment a true friend a real friend a genuine friend will tell you the truth even though it's unpleasant, may not be what you want to hear. Let's, let's see how this plays out with David and Jonathan. Let's go, Dave. All right. Wake him up back there, team. All right. First Samuel 21 and 2. What have I done? David exclaimed. 
What is my crime? Have I offended your father that he is so determined to kill me? That's not true, Jonathan protested. There are going to be times your friend's going to confront you with something, you're going to say, it's not true, I don't want to hear it. Let's read on. Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6 says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Here are some things that perhaps a real friend will say sometimes, and you may be called on to say, or maybe they, you, you're going to hear this from, from your friend. And I'm going to challenge you, if they care enough to confront you with the truth, when they have been your biggest supporter and your biggest encourager and your biggest cheerleader, and they've always been in your corner. Now, there are people who's always on our case. We discard it. And yeah, I think you really should. I, I don't pay attention to people that always criticize. But to those who's my biggest cheerleader and my biggest encourager, I, I sit up and take notice when they, they change. And they say, I just care too much about you to let you shipwreck. Sometimes a friend will say, I, I think you need to open your eyes and not be so naive. I really think your mate is cheating on you. You, you, you know, I know you love your son, but I think you need to be careful. I think he's really, really lying to you. You, you know, I think you need to really back off from that relationship. I, 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 I really feel that person isn't, doesn't have godly character, and you're going to endanger your, your, your spiritual well-being if you get in too deep a relationship with that person. Or maybe, you know, I, I don't think you should get involved in that Bible study you've been talking about. Uh, there may be some false teaching there, and I think you just need to back away from from that. Or perhaps, you, you know, I want you to really be careful. I, I know you're hurting, but I think you're developing too much dependency upon those, those, those painkillers. You need to try harder to get off of them. You know, I think you need to be real careful with your, your, your children. I, I, I think you need to show some tough love and discipline before it's too late. You, you, you know, I, I hear you always talk about money problems, but really I think you need to take a hard look at maybe cutting back and not eating out as much and not shopping as much and to not running around as much. And, and, and you, you really need to take this Dave Ramsey course how do you respond when somebody cares enough to confront you with heavy issues when you're at that crossroads we talked about that the decisions it's just going to make all the difference in the world true friends build that relationship upon truth they don't you don't want a doctor just to gloss over the x-rays and always tell you what you want to hear and say, well, he ain't going to like it if I tell him he has to have radical surgery and go through chemotherapy. Nobody likes that. But may be what is needed. I think that's a lot of reasons that a lot of people shy away from getting too close because they say, oh, I'm not going to tell them because I know what's going to happen. That relationship's going to blow up. And if it does, shame on you if you're the one that blows up when somebody's loved you enough and cared enough to tell you the truth. Because you're blowing through some red signs and red lights that you've never seen, obviously. And sometimes you need their perspective. The Bible speaks about the value of that friendship that we've read about. Number four, let's wrap it up with this. An intimate friend will keep his promises even though it's costly. You know, there's a time when that friendship is going to cost you. Maybe time, maybe money. Let's read here about Jonathan. 
and, and David. Tell me what I can do to help you, Jonathan exclaimed. David replied, tomorrow we celebrate the new moon festival. I've always eaten with the king on this occasion, but tomorrow I'll hide in the field and stay there until the evening of the third day. Let's read on. If your father asks where I am, tell him I ask permission to go home to Bethlehem for the annual family sacrifice. If he says fine, you'll know all is well. But if he's angry and loses his temper, you'll know he is determined to kill me. Ultimately, what happens is David becomes a fugitive and his life is, is, is never the same. And um, that friendship comes to an end much too soon for, for, for both of them. Let's read on. Show me this loyalty as my sworn friend, for we made a solemn pact before the Lord or kill me yourself if I've sinned against your father. But please don't betray me to him. Never, Jonathan exclaimed. So you see the covenant, the promises are being made here. And David says, my life depends upon you keeping your promises. Let's read on. So Jonathan made a solemn pact with David saying, may the Lord destroy all your enemies. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his vow of friendship again for Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. And we've read that earlier, those very same, same words. Promises. Intimate friend will keep his promises even though at times it's really high price. It's costly. Psalm 15.4 says this, Faithful followers of the Lord keep their promises even when it hurts. So those times when, when you say, man, if I keep my word, it, it's going to really hurt. You keep your word. You do what you say you're going to do. Integrity and true friendship is simply doing what you say you're going to do. Even though it may be costly. Jeff Foxworthy says, you know, a true friend is when somebody calls you up at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning and they say, hey, I'm in jail. Come and get me out. He says, and your friend doesn't ask, what have you done? He simply asks, where are you at? He said, now, if he was a real, real friend, he'd probably be in jail with you. But he says, nevertheless, he says, uh, a true friend just says, count on me. I'll be there. I don't need to know the details now. You know, that's the one thing about Jesus that makes him so special, isn't it? Jesus is a faithful friend. The Bible says he sticks closer than a brother and he keeps his promises. You know, there are people at the crossroads today and the outcome for them will determine will be determined by whether or not they have a friend to come alongside them. Bob Russell, several years ago, had the funeral for uh, 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 Pee Wee Reese. And he said, you know, he said, uh, before he died, you know, I was talking with him, and he said, I would heard this story. I wanted to know if it's true. And Pee Wee Reese affirmed that it was, that when he was playing baseball, and Jackie Robinson became the first to uh, break the, the, the barrier in, in, in playing baseball. He wasn't accepted. He was booed. There were racial slurs. It was, it was, it was just horrible. And he said there was a game when uh, I think they were playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And it uh, goes way back. But uh, he said that it's a crucial point in the game. And Jackie Robinson made an error. And the, Everybody just stood, booed and shouted. And he said, they made a pitching change. And he says, for those long minutes, Robinson went over to second base and just hung his head in despair. Pee Wee Reese went over there, put his arm around him, and just stood there hugging him. The boos subsided. And later, Jackie Robinson, a phenomenal player, he would go on to become, said, 
that arm about the shoulder saved his life and his career. You'll never know the difference you can make in somebody's life whose world has fallen apart to come alongside, put your arm around them and say, I, I genuinely care. You know, we, we shy away from those deep relationships, like I said, because they're costly, because of the commitments, and uh, because sometimes they're just messy. But boy, that's what it was for Jesus when he became our friend. If you don't think the cross wasn't costly or messy, then, then you don't understand the cross. He calls you and I to be that kind of a friend. Will you do that as we stand and sing your invitation to him?